Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. This podcast is sponsored in part by the Association of Professional Genealogists. You can find out more about them at www.apgen.org. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we head south to Florida to chat with genealogist Alvy Davidson. Alvy, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Good morning, Marion. Thank you for inviting me. Alvy, let's get started by having you tell us about yourself and give us an overview of your genealogy business. Well, from a personal aspect, I was born in North Alabama and raised throughout my entire life here in Central Florida. I have enjoyed my field of genealogy. It's become a whole, all-consuming world to me. Some people say that I'm too much of a genealogist. I don't think so. I have experienced every aspect of genealogy, from public speaking to research to whatever, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. It has become my love. Now, I know that you have done something else before you became a genealogy professional. Before we get into that, tell me about how you made the transition to become a genealogy professional. Well, I mean, you can, you can do it at the same time. What were you doing before, and, and how did you make this big leap? That is kind of a humorous aspect of my interview. For 25 years, I worked for a professional glass company that made bottles for soft drinks. I was the department supervisor. I know how to make bottles. I ran a machine for about 15 years, and then I moved into the supervisory area. And it was had nothing to do with genealogy. But that's what I did to support my family. And I always say it was a means to an end. I was able to retire early, retire young, and take my love of genealogy off into another aspect and support my family with it. And about 1994, I totally left the glass business and started a a genealogy business, got the proper licensing, the county permits and everything, and turned one-fifth of my house into a business. It's now my office. So when did this interest in genealogy start? Kind of a fluke. My, my mother-in-law at that time was always bragging about her family in Georgia, all the things they did in Georgia. And I just got tired of hearing it. I said, I'm going to prove that lady's wrong to myself. I went to the local historical library here in our county, which we have one of the best there is, And I researched for several days with my amateurish aspect. And lo and behold, what she said was not even the tip of the iceberg. Her family was very, very popular and prominent in Georgia. Her fourth great-grandfather was the first surveyor general of Georgia. Another great-grandfather was one of the first ministers to come into Georgia before the American Revolution. So she was tickled to hear that I had found out what she'd said was true. And that's what got me started with genealogy. I began to read, I began to read, and I began to read. I read everything I could get my hands on. And the major book that I'm going to encourage everybody to read page by page is Researcher's Guide to American Genealogy by Val Greenwood. I loved it. It just kept me so interested. So at this point, you're working and you're doing genealogy research on the side, and I imagine that you are focusing on your family, both your side of the family and your wife's side of the family, and you're completely bitten by the bug. Yes. Was it retirement that said, where did you get this crazy idea that you could make a living as a genealogy professional? Well, it was sort of the reverse of that. I was able to work out of a case one time an enormous amount of money by today's standards and I told my wife I said we can live off of this money for the next five years if we want to 
let's start a, a business. And I applied for my retirement from the company, and the rest is history. I kept making more money, making more money, making good money, and working for different people. And it took me a while to really feel comfortable, and I loved it. I truly loved it. Now let's talk about the transition, because what you were doing before is very different than operating a business on your own. How did you prepare yourself to open a genealogy business, both from an educational point of view and from a business skill point of view? I began to attend every conference that I could reasonably afford to go to and educate myself in listening to speakers, listening to some of the smart people in the field of genealogy. One of the gentlemen that was with me at the time, or came here at the time I started my local genealogical society was Dr. Meredith Colquitt. He spent two days here at my home, and it was a thrill to me to have a man of this stature right here in my home. And I picked his brain, and I had uh, Barbara M. Dalby, who lived in Tampa. She sort of picked me up and said, I'll teach you everything I can. I spent many, many hours in her study in Tampa before she finally retired with her husband and moved to Hawaii. Now she lives in Salt Lake City. She was such a wonderful mentor. She kept giving me books and advised me to buy this book and look at this book and learn more about the correct way to do genealogy. And with that in mind, I I said, I'll I'll do it or bust. And I did it. I, I got the proper licensing, which is required. I took my background in the the world of Naval Reserve, which is what I was at that time. I spent 22 years in the Naval Reserve, Naval Intelligence, and we'll deal with that later on. From that, I was able to parlay that into a private investigator's license, and I've had that since 1986. And these things gave me more tools to make my business successful, and without a successful business, You're not going to make it. Well, let's talk a little bit about that right now. With this experience he had, especially from the Naval Reserve, what skills did these bring to your business when you got started? How did they help you? Well, the thing that I did, my job in the Naval Reserve, was naval intelligence. And some people say that's an oxymoron, but I say it was was what taught me how to do background investigations how to deal and delve into people's lives to to be able to give them the appropriate security clearances that they had to handle classified information. I myself was holding a top secret clearance, and I was given the job of gathering information about individuals, passing it off to NSA, the National Security Agency, allowing them to take my work and move on with it and give the security clearances. With this knowledge in mind, I was also able to turn that into my own working tool, and it has become a very formidable means or portion of my genealogical world. Your work with the Naval Reserves, what does that look like in your background? Is that one week in a month, or is that a month every year? How does it play out in your everyday life? I was required to attend one weekend meeting each month, and also I had to go to a two-week session somewhere to further my skills. I could choose pretty well where I wanted to go. I would go to Key West. I would go to Norfolk, Virginia, Millington, Tennessee, New Orleans. Wherever I chose to go, they would send me, and I would work in the full-time people, the full-time naval intelligence people, and hone my skills learning from them. And they learned from me because I had a whole different aspect of it, adding genealogy to it. And when you're doing this intelligence gathering, is this something that's ongoing while you're doing your regular job? Or is it at specific times that you go and do that kind of work? Well, I was doing this at specified times, and it was ongoing. I would go to my own unit, which was in Orlando, and I would, we would be getting a new member two or three new members, and it was my job to take them aside, sit down in a room, and interview them. 
and gather from them what was needed to fill out their forms to do their background check. And believe you me, they pick your life apart. They know everything that happened to you from the time you first cried until your present day. So you can't hide anything because they'll start picking it apart. And if they find that you've told an error or put down something untruthful, kiss your security clearance goodbye. Now, you've got some great experience, especially in terms of um, research and intelligence gathering. But I'm sure that starting your own business, operating as, uh, I'm guessing that you started out just by yourself, on your own, you must have lacked some business skills. What were those, and how did you overcome them? I myself had never operated a business as a business. And whenever you're working without an employer taking money out of your paycheck every month to pay the IRS, I had to learn that the hard way. And eventually my accountant whipped me into shape. Alvy, you've got to put aside money for the taxes. After one year, I had to find out where I was going to get $21,000 to pay my taxes. I found it, but it was hard. So from that, probably it was one of the stiffest learning processes I ever had. And now I have it mastered. I don't worry about that. It's my taxes are paid every quarter. At the end of the year, I ante up whatever I got to pay. And that was probably my big learning curve. With putting genealogical research aside, do you think that success in business is a matter of putting the right systems in place to ensure success? Absolutely. If you are going to become a automotive mechanic, if you don't purchase the right tools, get the right training, and apply yourself accordingly, and keeping your, your skills honed and up to date, you're headed for failure. And that's what I did not want to happen with my business. I have over the years purchased and reinvested in my business over and over and over. I now own two of the best computers that you can buy that has high-tech access to many databases. I own nearly a thousand volume library here in my office. Not all that was bought. Many of those books were given to me. The Tampa, Hillsborough County Historical Association was going to get rid of their library. They asked me what did I want out of it. It was going to be free. I claimed every one of their Tampa City directories from 1925 to 1990, and they're in my library now. So these things are important to a successful business if you're in that arena, if you're in that field. And these city directories I've gotten have been a valued asset to me in working with where people lived, who lived there, who lived next door, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to get out of my chair and run down to a library. You've talked about investing in technology for your computers and investing in the day-to-day resources that make your work successful, like these books. And we know that education is very important to you. What are some of the big-ticket items that maybe somebody might not expect that you invested in your business that somebody else might say, oh, I don't want to spend the money on that? Well, I'll answer your question very abruptly. If you don't want to invest in your business, regardless of the expense, don't get into it. Because sometimes it was very, very difficult for me to shell out the money that I needed for a certain item. One of those things was when Florida first began to sell their index to vital records long before Ancestry ever thought of coming into existence. And the Florida State Division of Driver's License began to sell their microfiche indexes. I had to come up with a lot of money, but I was determined I was going to have them in my office. I have them now in my office dating back to 1977, and they're on microfiche, and I have a nice microfiche reader. If you're not willing to invest and bite the bullet, you're not going to be successful. That's put it in in a nutshell. For genealogy professionals starting today, you know, things look a little different now than when you first got started. What do you think are the most important areas that people need to focus on when they're first investing in their business? Maybe I sound a little bit unusual, but I still think that this is a computerized world. 
if you're not willing to uh, buy into the best computers and learn to use them to your advantage, you're not going to succeed. I'm not yet strong enough to reach out to Windows 8. I'm still running Windows 7, but someday I know I will have to go to Windows 8. And with that in mind, if you're not willing to pick this up and go with it, you're going to have a problem. You know, it's funny, that's not the answer I was expecting from you, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> but I think you're smart to hold off on Windows 8 for right now. <laughs> Let's just let them fix Absolutely. it a little bit. Can you share a story of an obstacle or a hiccup that you encountered when you first started your career and how you worked around it? Because nobody's perfect when they first get started. So I'd, I'd like to be able to share with our audience an example of something that didn't go right and how you learned from it and, and changed it so it didn't happen again. Well, there was a time not too long after I started my business that I suddenly experienced there was no business. I was not getting anything in. Nobody was calling on me. So I had to develop a way to appeal to the arena that was going to pay my payroll. So I immediately began to write letters to all of the attorneys in this area, telling them what my experience was, how I could help their business. And I didn't expect a whole lot out of it, but it happened. Two attorneys contacted me. And from that, I have developed a rapport with hundreds and hundreds of attorneys around the United States, in California, in Oregon, Washington, many, many, many of them here in Florida, and in New York, in Baltimore. These have just come by word of mouth. I've never spent a dime on large publication-based advertising, of course, taken out of that, my advertising I did in the APG quarterly. I, it went by word of mouth. Mrs. Jones, who lived in Miami, met Mrs. Smith at the Bar Association meeting in Chicago, and they began to discuss what their problems were. One of them said, well, why don't you contact this man? He helped me a lot. And lo and behold, it became to the point where now I'm having to turn down business. When you contacted those first lawyers, what services were you offering to them? I was reaching out to those who were probably needing to clear a land title, uh, find the right people who owned property because it was here in Polk County and I could go to the library, to the courthouse and do what I felt that their title company could not do. After that, one of those attorneys came back to me and said, I have a case here where we have got this elderly lady who's died and we need to find her heirs. Can you do that? Man, I was ready to grab that in a heartbeat. And I did and it was successful. And I learned to write my own reports that met their needs. I have developed my own affidavits that I submit to keep myself from having to go to court. And it's, it's been a smooth road since that time. Did you just say that you created your own affidavits to, to keep you from having to go to court? Right. So it, the goal it, is to prevent having to spend that time in the court? Right. I can write the affidavit, uh, and it's, it's in, in essence, it's a testimony. Here's what I found. Here was my end results. And I swear or affirm that there are no other family members of this family existing anywhere that can be located, ascertained, or determined. And I sign it. And I've never had a problem with that all the years. Of course, all this was done under the guidance of my own personal attorney in Tampa. Were there many other genealogy professionals doing this kind of work at the same time that you started? I really don't know. I'm being honest. I don't know if there was. Of course, this was before I joined up with APG. Of course, I learned a lot after I, I associated myself with APG. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people that were doing it at that time, but I have no knowledge of them. I was, I thought I was plowing new ground. It, it seems like in the last five years that this is really come together as a community to deal with these kinds of issues, forensic genealogy or air research and, and topics like that. Yes. Which came first, the CG or the PI license? I didn't get my CG until 1999. 
I was a PI in 1986. My A license was 1992. So I would say the PI came first. But with my going to classes and attending programs at Samford University and getting closely related with Kathleen Hinckley, she kept encouraging me. And the year after I met with her about that subject, I was approved as a CG. Initially, it was CGRS, but later they dropped the RS, and everybody was a CG. And I've had two renewals since that initial. Let's talk about the PI license first, since you, you got that first in 1986. What compelled you to get the private investigator's license, and how has that benefited your business? Well, I began to assist people here in this area with locating people who had abandoned bank accounts that had been deposited in the state of Florida. And there was a few little wrinkles in that, that people began to learn how to create false documents and get money that they were not entitled to. So the state of Florida at that time demanded and dictated that everybody who had anything to do with the office of abandoned property and these abandoned bank accounts would get a private investigator's license. At that time, there was quite a bit of materials that you had to gather. And with my years of experience in the Naval Intelligence, my chief petty officer in the Naval Intelligence signed my request for the license. And with his background, and they ran my fingerprints through NSA, and the rest is history. I got my license within six months but that was requirement by the state of Florida. Who knows? I might not have ever done that if they had not had that requirement. And getting the CG, becoming a board-certified genealogist, was that a, a conscious decision on your part to improve your business, to grow your business, or was it more of an educational challenge where you wanted to do a certain standard of work? Well, it was both, I would say. I was testifying in a court case over in Tampa, and the judge asked me several things about the documents, and I was giving him what I saw in each document. And then he paused momentarily, and he said, Mr. Davidson, by what authority do you speak? Your Honor, I don't know what you mean. He says, do you have a degree? No, sir. At that time, I set my goal to become a certified genealogist. I wanted to be able to say, I'm a board-certified genealogist. That's by what authority I speak. And I would be able to show the identification and prove it by doing my job. From that time on, I have kept my CG. In court cases today, is it a requirement to be a CG in order to testify? Not necessarily, but I have had many attorneys ask me that question up front. They've learned what a CG is, want to know if I'm a certified genealogist. And, of course, I say yes. They said, well, we felt it would be a little bit more to our advantage to have a report coming from a certified genealogist rather than just someone who says they're a genealogist. And I could see his point because there's some very heavy information that has to be passed and has to be done correctly by the standards it's set by the CG board, the, the GPS, genealogical proof standards. So you think it's a fairly wide common practice amongst attorneys today in these sorts of cases that they will look for a CG, that that's becoming a more of a standard? I believe it is, and more so just recently. I've seen several questions floating around on the APG mailing list. Someone is looking for a certified genealogist to do a research project that was going to be offered in court. They must know about certification or they would not ask that question. Let's talk about your involvement with the Association of Professional Genealogists. You've been on the board for many years. How has being a member, as well as being on the board, impacted your career and your education and the way you interact with the community? My biggest goal was to become a professional genealogist, not just in word, but in reality. And when I associated myself with APG, 
I did not take long to learn that by being associated with these thousands of persons out there who were in the field, that I began to know that I had friends. I had people that I could call on or they could call on me. And this furthered my desire to continue to grow and prosper my business. And I think by my being becoming known in the arena through APG and through my work with APG, and it, it has been a big help. I can't even put it in words how much help it has been for me. So what year was it that you first got involved with APG? Wow. I was asking myself that the other day. I don't remember exactly. I started on the board about about 15 years ago. So that would have been about 1990. Is that right? I don't remember exactly when I became a member. But not too long after I became a member, I put my name up for consideration for a board member for the southeastern region. And I didn't win the first time. And then I won the second time, the third time, and after the third two-year term, I couldn't run again, so I stepped out for a year and then put my name up for consideration again for two more years and then for two more years. And that was ending last year, and I chose not to put my name up for consideration for a third applicable term, and I told him I was not going to be available for consideration. In terms of being on the board and being a member of APG, can you give an example of some kind of interaction that was particularly meaningful, just as a way to show how this has impacted you or impacted others, either something that has benefited you or maybe you acting as a a mentor or giving guidance to another APG member? Can you just give me an example of something that would demonstrate how powerful it can be to be part of an organization like this. One thing that was a big plus in my association with APG was in a few years ago in Little Rock, Arkansas, we had a meeting there and I learned that Jan Davenport was going to step out as the booth chair, the vendor booth chair. And I thought, wow, what a great advantage if I can get that job. I did. And I think that becoming the vendor booth chair has been one of the arenas that I have used to my advantage, and I hope to believe to the advantage of APG, my exposure, my skills to other people, and my time spent at the APG booth and my exposure to the many people who stopped by and talked with me and asked my advice and I spent many hours on that booth that I w- was not required. I could get someone to stay there in my place, but I loved it. The interaction, interaction with other members and with prospective members, and it was just a thrill to me to be able to talk with all these people that came to the booth and ask questions about APG. How would it benefit me? And it was, it was a big thing for me. How did you feel that it was an advantage to you? I believe that my skills was exposed. My talents as a genealogist was exposed. People could, could pick my brain more or less, which I didn't mind. And it, it was a, a joy to be able to spread the knowledge of genealogy as I had learned it from adding 30 plus years to it. And experience tells a lot. And that's what I was sharing with other people, my experience. Alvy, how have you balanced paid work versus volunteering? Well, I, I'm very particular about who I volunteer to do work for. I do a lot of pro bono work. I sometimes use it a little bit selfishly because somebody will say, well, how can I pay you for this? I have an entity that I tell them, if you want to make a donation to this entity, go for it. But I'm not asking you to pay me a dime. And to know they're donating to this organization that has been one of my pet organizations for years, it benefits me tremendously emotionally to know that I'm helping them, plus I'm helping this other organization at the same time. And as I say, I pick and choose who I will pro bono work for. I don't, uh, if somebody came to me and asked for me to do work without charging, I wouldn't do it. 
Now, your involvement with APG is also volunteer work. It was. Have you done volunteer work for other organizations, or do you pick one organization and focus on that? Well, for the past 15 years, I focused on APG. I have done a lot of volunteer work locally for the local historical library that is located in our county seat. I don't tie myself to going on regular hours and saying, I'll be here three days a week from nine to five. No, I don't do that. I don't have the time, really. But I do offer my services for anybody that wants to ask. What is the most fun project that you've ever worked on that you can share with us? Wow. I've got to really think about that one a second. I would say that I got involved with a lovely person in Hollywood one time, and I don't mean that in a bad way. She was trying to find her grandparents who lived in Tampa, Florida. And she learned of me, and she contacted me. We spent many hours on the telephone. Her husband was a producer out there in Hollywood. And for the work that I did for her, I didn't charge her a dime. Because it was, it was a learning experience for me to learn what was available to me here in this county. And I found her grandparents. I found them not too difficult in the, of all places, the divorce records of this county in the 1930s. Shortly after they married and had a baby, they got divorced and went their separate ways. But in reading the divorce papers, it was hilarious. The man was suing his wife for divorce because he got tired of her beating him up and putting him in the china closet. And that, to me, was a thrill. And passing it back to her and letting her read all this material about her grandparents, whom she never knew. But now she knows about her grandparents and where they came from. She took the ball and ran with it. She even invited me out one time to spend a day or two with her and her husband in Laguna Beach, California. And I had a ball. It was quite a thrill for me. I wonder if that story ever made its way into a sitcom. <laughs> it would have been funny. <laughs> yeah. it would have been fun. And it was so detailed in the interrogatories as the questions are asked in the divorce, page after page after page of interrogatories of the disputes between the husband and the wife. And that was the final end of it. The, the judge declared they divorce. And the, today it's dissolution of marriage. At that time it was divorce. Let's take a quick break to hear a message from the Association of Professional Genealogists. Hi, I'm Darcy Hindpose, APG board member, awards committee chair, and member of the Youth Committee. Do you know a student and or young professional who aspires to a career in genealogy? The Association of Professional Genealogists invites applications for its Young Professional Scholarship, which gives free registration and reimburses the winner for up to $1,000 for travel and lodging costs incurred when attending APG's annual professional management conference. The deadline for submissions is July 22nd, and more information is available at www.apgen.org. The winner will be announced in August 2014. The future of genealogy depends upon fostering relationships among genealogists at all levels and supporting young professionals who bring fresh perspective to our field. All right, Alvy, we are going to change the pace a little bit, make things a little quicker, change the tempo, and we are going to enter the lightning round. Are you ready? I am ready. I've got my water bottle sitting right here. Oh, good. What was the one thing you were most afraid of in starting your business? Succeeding. I was afraid I would not succeed. I could not. I had money, but I, that wasn't succeeding in business. I thought that there would be a point where I couldn't make it. I just would have to go out and find me a job somewhere. It didn't happen. What is the best advice you've ever received? Barbara Dalby was my best advisor. She said, study, study, study. And I followed her advice. And had I not, I'm sure I would have headed down the road to failure. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? Find somewhere where they can get some confidence. If you don't have self-confidence, you're not going to make it. And I believe that I have self-confidence, and I believe that's been my one of my key ingredients to adding to education 
having no formal education other than high school, I believe that you need some drive, you need some determination, and you need some confidence. Do you think that there are active steps that people can take to build their self-confidence? I'll tell you where I got my self-confidence. Before that time, I had no self-confidence, really. I took the Dale Carnegie course here in a local college six months long. I was 100% different coming out of that course than I was when I went into it. If you had looked at me 40 years ago and said, do this program today, I would have probably stammered and stuttered and been ashamed and hung up the phone because I had no self-confidence. That's powerful. That That's a really, really wonderful answer. And I, I really hope that people listening will actively engage in a solution just like Alvi suggested. Do you have a productivity tool or an app that you love that you can share with the audience? Productivity. Mm. <laughs> well, you had, you had early productivity tools when you very early on in your career, when you were buying those microfilms and ensuring that they were in your library so that you can access them at a moment's notice. Now, granted, that it, it's not technology, but, it, I mean, it was at the time, and that was a productivity tool. We think of productivity in different ways now, but you've definitely made that an aspect of your career. And I've also learned to use technology from the electronic aspect of it and that I don't have to run back to my computer to get information. I have my iPhone there in my hand. It's my reach out to the world. And all the apps that are on there, I don't use them all, of course, but some of them are extremely valuable to me, being able to grasp one thing in a hurry and communicating with the world. Wherever I am, I'm in touch with the world. I don't have to worry about running to a telephone somewhere. I have it right there in my hand. So what's one of those apps that you value so much? Wow, Dropbox. (laughs) Genealogists are in love with Dropbox, that's for sure. I have it, and my researcher in Salt Lake City that I use, Luana Darby, a wonderful lady, when I see something coming from her, I know where it is. It's in Dropbox. Mm -hmm. And she labels it so unique. I never would have thought of this. The day of the report the date, calendar date of the report. So I don't have to ask her, what name did you put on that report? Smart. Yeah. Yeah, well, Luana is a smart lady, so. (laughs) The date the report was created is the date of my report. What is your preferred social media channel, or don't you do social media? I use, of course, Facebook, but I have learned from the use of others that are sort of dated now. MySpace was a moneymaker for me for a while. Because I was using it to find people and tell them that I had some money for them if they wanted it. But now Facebook has been my tool. And when some, when I know that the person I'm looking for happens to be a young person, young meaning under 50 probably, the first place I look is to see if they have a Facebook page. Because I can establish communication with them there. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? Now you mentioned Val Greenwood earlier, so maybe a different book this time. I would say probably Professional Genealogy or The Source. I love Lou Zooks. She's a wonderful friend of mine, and I love the way they put together The Source. And then, of course, Professional Genealogy. I admire Elizabeth Sean Mills. She's been a, a dear friend of mine for years, and I think that that was a wonderful book put together. And today is being utilized for the purpose for which it was put together. Yeah, it's wonderful how that has manifested, hasn't it, into the ProGen study groups and is is just actively engaging genealogy professionals around the world. I think it's definitely exactly how it should have been used. Right now we're going to do a new feature we call Tips from the Pros, with you, of course, being the pro. And Uh let's talk about private investigation. Can you explain to us, about the the C license, the A license, the need for apprenticeship, and also the commitment of hours that somebody has to put in to give somebody a flavor of what they're getting involved in by getting a private investigator's license. First of all, if you want to become a private investigator, you need to reach out to the government organization within your state. Here in the state of Florida, it happens to be the office of the Department of Agriculture. Why? I don't know. 
and find out what it takes to become a private investigator. The first step in Florida is you must apprentice at least two years with an A license or an agency license. And after that two-year period, you're putting in interim reports to the state of Florida so they see that you are doing what you said you wanted to do. At the end of two years, you're issued a C license, which is a personal investigator's license. And in the future, if you want to go beyond that, you can establish your own agency by applying for an A license or Class A license for which you pay a fee of $300 and you have your own agency then. I got mine in 1992 and it's still hanging on my wall up here. Of course, every five year, every three years, they renew that for an additional $300. And initially, they required liability insurance for this, but they eventually dropped that because we were the only professional organization in the whole state of Florida that was required to have a liability insurance policy. Doctors didn't have them. Lawyers didn't have them. The private investigators had to have them. Of course, branching off of the license, you can also get other licenses to allow you to carry a weapon, et cetera, et cetera. But I have never reached out on that because of the, the I don't need a I don't, don't need a weapon. And you had mentioned to me earlier about a commitment of hours. Is that after you get your C license? That's in the process of getting the CC license, the apprentice license. You must commit to certain numbers of hours to show the state of Florida that you are doing the work to become a investigator. An investigator has to put in so many hours dictated by the Department of Agriculture. And adding to this a little bit is, is necessary if you want to succeed to associate yourself with a state professional organization of private investigators here in Florida. It's what we call FALI, Florida Association of Licensed Investigators, which is approximately a thousand members now. I was once on the board of directors of that organization, and they are a lot of great guys. They're just like APG. They're great. They're going to help you. They have an annual educational conference that you can go to to learn more about your field, your arena. I even was asked to speak at one of those at one time. So it's, it's a great organization of men. They're professionals. They are dedicated, and it's a needful thing. When would you suggest that somebody obtain a PI license to augment their genealogy career? If you're looking in an arena that's involving money, usually it would be good to have a license because you're covering yourself for any possibility of somebody accusing you of something that you didn't do. And they're going to look at your license and say, if you didn't have quality, you wouldn't have that license. If you didn't have integrity, you wouldn't have that license because you are scrutinized pretty much like what went on when I got my security clearance with the Naval Reserve. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. The best advice I can say is if you want to become a professional genealogist, set your sights high and go for it. Get your good, some good education. Go to as many conferences as you can possibly afford. I began to pick out those that were nearest to my house. Then I started going to those further away. And I learned from these. I learned immensely from these. I would love to go to the one on the West Coast, the Southern California Jamboree, but I just never have found the time to put that much time in going out there. And the best way to get in touch with me is through my web page, which has been a jewel for me. It's floridadetective.net. I have everything on that page you want to know. It's what I do, my phone number, my email address, and my cell phone number's not on there, and I don't think I'll put it on this either. Uh, It rings enough anyway. But that's how you reach out to me. Alvy Davidson, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. Well, thank you, Marion, for inviting me. Well, this interview with Alvy Davidson was probably a little bit more different than some of the other interviews that we've done. He has a very unique background in the Naval Reserve and and working in a glass factory and having a private investigator's license. So his focus in genealogy is perhaps a little bit different. We didn't really use the term forensic genealogy, but really Alvy was a pioneer in forensic genealogy, first starting with clearing land titles and then 
uh, working on air research. And I'm just going to toss it out there right now. Forensic genealogy really means, for those of you who are kind of still wondering what it's all about, is forensic genealogy is working with uh, the legal system with lawyers. And that's really what the difference is with forensic genealogy and just regular genealogy cases. And so his experience and and what he has done has been a little bit different. And he's had some really unique experience uh, because of that. Uh, Also working with the abandoned money in the state of Florida. And that was the reason for getting his PI license. So that was kind of a really interesting twist. But in addition to his unique work experience. He's also been very active within the genealogical community as a director for APG and as a member, also uh, as the vendor booth manager, which he saw as a great opportunity to reach out to people, both the people who had come to the booth and other professionals. And of course, his fun project uh, with the person from Hollywood. That was just uh, awesome. And it just goes to show you, you never know what you're going to find when you're doing genealogy research or where you're going to find it, such as he found in the court records. His experience with Dale Carnegie, that really impacted me a lot. When I asked Alvi that question about confidence, I really, really had no idea what sort of answer he was going to come up with. And that was such a a super amazing answer. And it's what I I guess I liked even better was that it was a really an actionable answer. And and I'll even admit, sometimes I have problems with confidence. And so that's a real thing that we need to to tackle. So I hope you'll take that to heart, that advice from Alvi. That's great. You know, uh, some people are blessed to have a, a great sense of confidence all the time. But the rest of us, we might need a little confidence boost every once in a while, and that might be a good way to get it. This week for our action item, I want to hone in on what Alvi was saying about investing in your business. It has been very important for him to invest in his business, both with money and with time by seeking educational opportunities. I want you to think this week about in what way should you be investing in your business, looking at the long term to make your business better. Are you spending time right now, wasting time doing things because you don't have the proper equipment, whether that's a computer or a mobile device that you could use in the field? In terms of mobile devices, boy, once I got my smartphone, oh, it's amazing how that can help you in the field. When you learn new genealogical information, but you don't have all the background research, you can then open up your phone or your iPad or whatever it is and start to do that research right there. And then you can do even more research in the field because you don't have to go back to your office to get it. So what is it that you need to do to invest in your business? Is it equipment? Is it educational opportunities? This week, I want you to make a list of the things that you can invest in, take your money that you're earning from your clients, reinvest it in your business, and improve your business. What would that be? Make a list of five things that you would do, and then think about how you can make that a reality. Is it a a time thing where you need to budget your time? Is it a money thing where you need to budget your money? But make that list and then see if you can make it happen. Until next week, so long. 